And you may have been patient. And you may be being patient. And God wants you to continue to be patient in your life until Jesus comes again. And when we see Jesus Christ, there will be no need for patience. We'll be with the Lord. There will be no more sin, no more tears, no more death, no more devil, no more evil, no more sadness, no more sickness. Nothing but righteousness and peace and mercy and grace eternally and more than we can even know. But down here we need to be patient. Now, what James also does in these verses is he gives us a number of different examples and applications about being patient. You'll notice in verse 7, he says, here's the first one, a farmer. He says, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. They knew all about farmers. Many of them were farmers. It was an agricultural society. This would have rung true to them. A farmer has to wait for his crop. They would have rains that would come in October, November. They would have rains that would come then the last rains in April or May. And so in between those two, the farmer had to wait. He knew that there was something that was going to come, but he had to wait. And so James is saying, you be patient, you wait. Look how the farmer waits. He has to go through a period of time. You also, he says, be patient. He repeats it in verse 8. So the next time, and it'll be quick because we live in a farming community, but the next time you see a man out here working in his field, You'll see one right over here, the Vossler Farms. You can see somebody on a tractor out there plowing that earth. We saw one just the other day coming back from lunch. They were harvesting and then they were chopping everything up, getting ready to replant it. I mean, they were going at it. But every time we see a farmer, maybe the Lord can help remind us, oh yeah, they have to be patient. And we have to be patient in our troubles. And so it's repeated again there in verse 8. You also, just like the farmer, you be patient. And then there's a second thing that he says in verse 8. And that is establish your hearts because the coming of the Lord is at hand. Now to establish your hearts, what does it mean? Well, it literally means to strengthen and confirm them in the final certainty, the Lord's coming. And so he's saying, be patient, but within your heart, you are to confirm in your heart your decision, your attitude, your understanding. A confirmation is a second step to the first step. The first step is... This is what the Lord wants me to do. He wants me to be patient. Now I need to strengthen and establish my heart. I need to confirm that is what I'm going to do. It's very, very helpful to us, especially if we're in a serious crisis. And you know, when you're in a crisis, uh, options are galore. Usually just any get me out of here option is right at the front of your mind. I have different places I'd like to move to. Sometimes I want to go to the west coast of California. Other times I want to go as far east as I can to Florida. And, and I think, well, it's too long to get to Florida. I'll just drive over to the coast. And then I'll just keep driving right into the ocean. Take care of all the problems. But really, the Lord directs us and he speaks to you when you're going through a difficult time and, and you begin to understand, okay, I know what God wants me to do. I know what I should do. Okay, you've got that? Okay, now confirm that. You make a decision. I'm going to do what God tells me to do. Period. Instead of just, well, I, I, I got this idea, but I'm kind of thinking, you know, maybe I should do this or kind of leaning over here and you're just kind of swaying through these different options that can just swirl around in your mind and within your soul. He's saying you establish your heart. What has God called you to do? Then you make a decision. This is what I'm going to do. Jesus is coming. This is the big picture. 
the coming of the Lord is at hand. And the early church lived with the expectancy that Christ could come at any moment. And we ought to live in that same expectant attitude. And we ought to make decisions in light of the reality Jesus is coming and he could come today. He could be here before we know it. Versus our thinking, well, I'm going to do this or I don't want to do that. I'm going to go do this and I'll do this and I'll do that. And we completely forget that Jesus is coming. So you make the decision, you make the confirmation within your own heart. Now, another little application in verse 9. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, and here's why. Lest you be condemned, and thirdly, behold, the judge is standing at the door. Now, what does this mean to grumble against one another? It means do not complain against one another. Don't complain to somebody about somebody else. Don't do it. Why? Because you stand to be judged. You see, Jesus is standing at the door. So don't complain about somebody. It'll come back on you. There's a consequence to be paid when you complain. Now, sometimes, maybe, we think we have the spiritual gift of complaining. I don't know. <laughs> well, I was just telling the truth, you know. Well, there's no spiritual gift called grumbling, mumbling, complaining. It's just plain old complaining. It does absolutely nothing to move the ball forward. It doesn't build morale. In fact, it can spread like a cancer. It can lower morale. It can destroy unity. It can cause great, great trouble. Great trouble. It presents unnecessary obstacles that now need to be dealt with. You get a complaining spirit, it'll spread like wildfire. I really think, and I'm speaking to myself as much as, I'm speaking more to you, but I'm just kind of saying that to make it sound better. I'm speaking to myself as much as I am to you because we're all men with the same natures. But even as we would say and have said so many times recently, you know, if somebody's gossiping, just don't participate in it because it's wrong. It's as wrong as if somebody said, hey, you want to see some pornography? We say, well, that's wrong. Well, so is gossiping. Well, complaining is the same thing. The next time somebody starts complaining to you, just don't participate in it. Just stop it. Just say, hey, could I pray for you? Yeah, well, could I complain for a few minutes? <laughs> no. <laughs> Brother, let's, let me pray for you. Just try that out. See what happens. Because he tells us here, don't complain. Well, I'm just confiding in somebody. Well, you don't have to complain. There's a distinct difference. and We don't care to make that distinction. We'd rather just complain. But he tells us here, do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned or you're judged. It'll come back on you. And then he gives another example about suffering. In verse 10, he says, my brethren... And I always love this about James. He continues to remind them, hey, I'm with you. You're with me. We're in the family of Christ, my brethren. And I look at Scott or I look at Abel or Bill or Eric or Tom or, or anybody right up and down the rows here. We're in Christ together. We're in a family together. And James is saying, my family members, my brethren... Here's something that will help you. He says, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. I've been telling you, be patient, he says. I've told you twice. 
I've given you one illustration about the farmer. I'm encouraging you, don't grumble, but here's something that'll help you. Think of the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all of the minor prophets. Take them as examples of suffering and patience. They suffered and they were patient. Here's an example for you. They went through lots of suffering. They lived in deserts, can you imagine? They lived in caves. They went without the basic necessities of life. Some of them were stoned to death. Some of them were cut in half. They were burned alive. They were martyred. They paid the ultimate price in their obedience to Jesus Christ. They suffered greatly. Take them as an example. In fact, in just a week or two on Wednesday nights, and I encourage you to come, we begin the book of Isaiah. He came and he ministered in the southern kingdom during the reign of King Hezekiah. He brought a message from God. And do you know that his message was not very well received? And here were people who were chosen by God, called by God. They delivered the word of God and they suffered greatly, but they were patient. So those are an example for us. Take, for example, these people. And then in verse 11, to follow that up, he says, Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You know, those prophets didn't give up. Pastor Mike was reminding me just the other day as we were talking a little about this that Jeremiah, I think he had no converts. There was no visible fruit for all of his ministry. But he didn't give up. He stayed at his post. He hung in there. They, he endured. And we always count people blessed who don't give up. When they hang in there, they go through it. There's a blessing. They are blessed for being in that process. And we count them as blessed. We'll, we'll say, my hat is off to you. You've hung in there. There's something magnificent and wonderful about a person who hangs in there. I meet people who've, you know, done 20, 25, 30 years in prison. I mean, in their profession. Excuse me. Listen, I'm just so far ahead of you uh, in humor that I'm sorry. I'm just way, way, way ahead of you. But when I meet people who've, you know, 30 years in one profession, I always say to them, wow, congratulations. Man, you, you hung in there all of those years, 40 years, 35 years, 27 years, 50 years. And that's... That is amazing. They've endured. They didn't run. They didn't give up. They didn't throw the towel in. You talk about throwing the towel in. I mean, we could have a whole closet full of towels to throw in like one every hour, every day. They didn't do that. They hung in there. They endured. And we count them blessed who endure. Why is that? Because God did a work in their lives. God is doing a work in their lives. God was faithful to them and they believed God. They received divine ability to go on. They humbled themselves before.